All right, Ecclesiastes for Beginners. This is lesson number seven in this uh, series. Title of this lesson, one plus one equals survival. One plus one equals survival. And we are in Ecclesiastes chapter four, chapter four. So as uh, we have seen so far in our study of Ecclesiastes, Solomon describes his uh, life and uh, describes it uh, in his uh, journal. And he talks about the different lifestyles that he has pursued in the search for happiness and contentment apart from having a relationship with God. You know, life under the sun, life under the sun, that catchphrase means life here on earth, life without um, without uh, reference uh, to God. And his, in his experiment with uh, wealth and power, we talked about that last time, he, uh, he concludes that life at the top is filled with grief, uh, oppression, envy, disillusionment. Many times this is what you find when you finally get to the top. And um, in the section that we're going to talk about today, He's going to summarize the most common feeling experienced by those who make it to the top of any enterprise, and surprisingly, it's loneliness. Loneliness. He discovers that the ironic thing about loneliness is that no amount of success can insulate one from that feeling. You can't get rich enough to push away loneliness. You can't have enough things that will protect you from loneliness. Uh, how many times have we heard people who are famous, world famous, everybody knows their name, and yet when they are interviewed or when they write about their own life, they talk about being lonely, being alone in a sea of, in a sea of people. And so Solomon talks about this you know, 3,000 years, uh, 3, years ago, a very common human experience. So in these few verses he describes the antidote for loneliness and how this antidote, just like the loneliness itself, is available to everyone whether you're at the top or at the bottom. So let's talk a little bit about loneliness itself. The word loneliness refers to both a perception and an emotion, something you sense and something you feel. The perception or image of loneliness is that of being on one's own, uh, without connections to other individuals through friendship or family, or corporately through association of shared history or ideals or objectives. You know, one of the most uh, difficult problems of people who suffer culture shock is loneliness since they're cut off from both friends and family as well as their country, their politics, their history, their ideals that their former dwelling provided. You know, a lot of talk about immigration these days in, in politics, you know, what should our immigration policy be? How can we be fair but at the same time you know, maintain the law and of, of this country? And you know, th those are difficult issues. But if you kind of strip away the politics and just look at what it's like being an immigrant uh, usually the, 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 the sense of the individual who's an immigrant uh, is loneliness. You come from a country, never mind the Middle East, you just come from Europe or, or any other country, and you come to this country, and yes, there is a, a certain excitement, the land of opportunity, it still is the land of opportunity, the land of wealth, the land where the government is not going to come in and bulldoze your house down, or you know, you know, there, there are certain expectations for people who come from other countries, especially countries that are poor, and, and make it here legally. And uh, you know, the, they're, they say there's like an 18 month kind of whiplash. There's this high that you get when you, you get your, your green card and then you finally get you take the, you know, I know this because I went through this having come from Canada, take the oath of, uh, the, oath of the citizenship. You know, with all other people, that was amazing. There were, I don't know, a couple of hundred people when Lisa and I took our oath of citizenship and all kinds of different people. They named all the countries. So many, so many people from this country and that country. And the, the thing that I noticed the most about that particular time was how proud everyone was to take that oath and to get your official citizenship you know, document because it takes years to do this. And, a lot, and you have to jump through a lot of hoops. 
But the whiplash usually comes 18 months after, after the high of being in a new place and you've got this and opportunity, da, da, da. But all of a sudden, you can't find the ingredient that you need to make the food that you're used to eating back in your country. They just don't have that type of beans or they just don't have that you know, type of meat or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, mm, boy, wouldn't it be good to have, you know, not just my mother's cooking, but wouldn't it be good to have that food that is typical of the place where you come from? One of the things that Lisa and I do, and the kids as well, when we fly back to Montreal, and let's face it, Montreal is not that much different than the United States, you know, and yet it has its own culture, is we go on, uh, on a food, uh, a food uh, vacation. In other words, when I get there, okay, I'm going to go to uh, the New Verdun for Bambino pizza, and then we're going to go to St. Hubert barbecue for the roasted chicken, and then on Thursday, we're going to this other restaurant. because you know, we, we, we go eat our favorite foods that we cannot get here. And so the sense of loneliness you know, uh, is certainly felt by those who, who emigrate here, even in the best of circumstances. Now I can imagine in the worst of circumstances, if you're like a refugee, a legitimate refugee, how difficult that must be as well. Because the further you move and the more often you change, the greater the perception of separateness and loneliness. So loneliness not only has a face and an image, but it also has a heart or a feeling. As a feeling, loneliness has a range of emotions. Fear, anger, anxiety, heaviness, sorrow, discouragement. These are all individual feelings that can be attached to loneliness. Now, the emotion of loneliness is usually dictated by the cause of the separation. For example, culture shock loneliness, you know, if, if your loneliness is caused by culture shock, usually the way you feel, the way you feel that loneliness is it feels like fear. It feels like anxiety, discouragement, a, a sense of unreality because you've moved from one culture and country that looks a certain way to another country that, whose language and the buildings are different and everything's different. And so you know, you're processing every single day, everything you see and hear is different and new. And usually what happens when that you know, happens week after week after week, people get a sense of unreality. So their loneliness feels like it's not real. I can't get in touch with, with reality. That's why people are so happy you know, when, when we're here in, in the States and we happen to, I remember when Paul was, uh, our oldest was playing hockey and, and I would take him to practices and bump into other parents. And I'd bump into parents and we'd start talking, come to find out they were from Canada. Oh, you know, and they were from Quebec. They wanted to speak French right away. <laughs> Why? You know, we're, we, we, we both spoke English. We were here just to hear the sound of French again, because you never hear it when you're here. Um, another example, loneliness caused by forced separation, like death or divorce or dispute. That kind of loneliness feels like anger and fear and sorrow. Still loneliness, just the emotion is experienced differently. So loneliness is a normal part of life. It's like a small island that we sometimes inhabit as the seasons of our lives change. And since our lives do uh, inevitably change, we need to recognize that we will eventually often visit the island of loneliness for periods of time. The danger is making a permanent home for ourselves on the island of loneliness. We know that we've been on the island of loneliness too long when we hear ourselves say things like the following. Why don't people love me and help me? This question suggests that we are shifting the responsibility for our loneliness onto everyone else's shoulders except ourselves. And we begin to deal with our loneliness by blaming other people for it. In other words, I'm lonely 
because of other people. Now, if I go back to the immigration you know, example and uh, used myself and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm lonely and it's everybody else's fault and how come nobody's, well, you know, what about me? How come I'm not reaching out? Why don't I go to the Canadians living, you know, there's a little club you know, for Canadians who, who are living abroad and they have potluck dinners and they talk about Canada and hockey and so, you know. Sometimes, you know, I've got to do something to help myself deal with the loneliness that I am experiencing. Uh, another thing we say, if only other people realize how difficult things are for me. This question is a cover for attention getting strategies, you know, woe is me type thing, some self pity. Most of the times we want to get people to listen to our problems without trying to get to solutions. As a minister, I've experienced that a lot. People are wanting to tell me the problem that they're having and to explain in great detail their problem and to give all the reasons for the problem. And the only thing that doesn't become part of our discussion is some sort of solution to the problem. They, they tend to talk over me when I begin to come back and say, well, you know, maybe have you ever tried it? Oh yeah, oh, I tried that already and then move on. And, you know. and so here an individual may be dealing with their loneliness through self-pity. Another thing people hear themselves say, nobody cares. I mean, I'm lonely and I really am all alone in this thing. So this isn't a question, it's an attitude. It's a kind of a pride that assumes one's own problems are greater and more complex than anyone else's problems. Here we struggle with loneliness by wearing it as a badge somehow, a martyr complex. So we cannot get off the island of loneliness by blaming other people for putting us there or by sitting under a palm tree and feeling sorry for ourselves or stoic self-resignation. We get off the island of loneliness by calling out for help. You know, send up a smoke signal, drop a note in a bottle, paddle out to the next island and see who's there. And so getting back to uh, Solomon and his solutions, Solomon recognized that loneliness afflicted everyone, even the people at the top, suggesting that he too may have been lonely. Imagine. We look at these Bible characters and we idealize them, but many times forget that they were real people. They had real emotions, real problems. So uh, the solution to loneliness and the feelings of alienation uh, Solomon is talking about was the simple acknowledgement that we need companionship. The fact that he writes about this says he experienced this type of loneliness, but he provides a solution. And what's interesting about Solomon, if he is expressing the idea that he sensed, that, you know, he had a, a sense of loneliness, this guy had a thousand wives. <laughs> 700 wives, 300 concubines, but I mean, you know, you'd think he'd be the last person in the world. You'd think he'd be the first one to say, look, I just want to be alone, right? <laughs> but we've already said many times people who are surrounded by people, servant, he had servants and bodyguards and wives and helpers and gophers and all that business. And yet he, he talks about being lonely. We cannot enjoy life to the fullest as loners. My point here is that sometimes we bring that loneliness onto ourselves. People have been created to function at their very best in the company of other people. You know, Adam knew God and had fellowship with God and the creation by himself. But yet until there was another human being created to be with him, he was lonely. Have you ever noticed that in the scenes of heaven, we are not to enjoy eternity in solitary union with God, but in fellowship with the saints. Ever notice that? 
It's never just, oh, when I get to heaven, it'll just be me and God, it'll be this wonderful relationship, I'll be able to be absorbed and I will know him, he will know me, I won't need to eat. Notice it says there'll be no tears, you won't need food, you won't need light, you won't, the, you won't be sick, you won't be tired, you won't, there'll be no sin. Oh, the one thing that, that it doesn't say there won't be any of is other people. There will be other people. Because we're not God. God is the only one who can be just one. Who is sufficient unto himself. He created us in such a way that we are not sufficient unto ourselves. We need first him, but we also need other people to be complete. So in Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine to 12, Solomon reiterates this truth and he gives three reasons why friends are a necessity in life and companionship is the antidote to loneliness. So let's read some of these verses, shall we? In verse nine, chapter four, he says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. So Solomon, as is his usual style, states the conclusion first. It's better to go through life with someone else than to go it alone. So here he's not just talking about marriage, but every morally responsible relationship is referred to or included here. Life is tough. We need help to get through life. Even the Lone Ranger wasn't alone. <laughs> He had Tonto, right? Robinson Crusoe, my favorite book as a kid. I must have read it 200 times. Something about being an only child, I guess. <laughs> Robinson Crusoe would not have kept his sanity without his man Friday. You ever notice the worst punishment for the worst criminals in jail is what? Solitary confinement, not whipping. Not physical, you know, beating them up, not cutting down their food rations. They really want to punish somebody. They isolate them by themselves. No contact, little slit opens, zoop, your food goes through. You're in the solitary confinement cell 23 out of 24 hours by yourself. And that other hour, you don't get to go with the main, you know, in the main yard and talk with your buddies. No, 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 no. They let you out into an empty yard so you can get some exercise and fresh air so your muscles, you know, you don't spend the whole day laying around. So the cruelest of punishment is what? Making you go by yourself. Isn't that what we do with our children? When they misbehave, okay, that's it. Just, okay, time out, go to your room, just sit there by yourself and think about it. You know. How long do they last before they're screaming, I want to go, three minutes, right? Now in the next three verses, the next three verses rather contain three reasons why companionship and not sex or money or power or prestige. Why companionship is the answer to loneliness. So in verse 10 he says, for if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. So why is it better to go through life with a companion? Well, first he says one encourages the other when the other is weak. We would not need friends if we never made mistakes, if we never sinned, if we were never sick. Friends, however, are our guard against being totally overwhelmed by either illness or troubles or circumstances in our lives. Nothing is more enjoyable than helping a friend and nothing is more humbling and spiritually maturing than allowing ourselves to be ministered to by our friends. 
You know, a lot of times we'll take ministry, we'll receive ministry from our family, you know, our children, or moms, or brother. You know, we'll take it, it's family, that's what they're supposed to do. But somehow it's always a little more difficult to accept ministry from just a friend. Hey, your daughter can't take you to the hospital for your thing or whatever. You know, I'll come by and drive. You know, no, no, I don't want you to go. I'll, she'll do it. No, 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 no. She's got the kids and they've got a thing at school. Let me come by and help you. Okay. You know, right? And yet when we allow, allow our friends to actually minister to us, it's very edifying. In verse 11, he says, furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? You know, the sum is greater than the parts. There are things I just cannot do by myself or for myself, but can be accomplished with the help of my friends. It can be business or the development of certain elements in my personality. We need friends to make us whole in various areas of our lives. We need our friends to help us raise our children. You know, my friends help and encourage and console me concerning my children when they, when they were growing up. I can remember evenings over at a friend's house, we finally, you know, try to get a babysitter for four children. Try, you go ahead and try that sometime. You'll see that that's not very easy. We usually had to hire two people to come in, you know, one to protect the other one, you know, but. But anyways, when we, when we did get you know, someone to babysit, <clears throat> and then we would go out to a friend's house, oh my goodness, <laughs> able to sit and eat our meal without giving instructions to other people on how to eat their meal, and to sit there and have an adult conversation for two hours, and what did we talk about for two hours? The kids, our kids, their kids, because they got a babysitter and the four of us managed to go to, I don't know, Olive Garden or something. What did we do? We talked about the kids. And realized that, hey, oh, wait a minute, your kids are driving you crazy? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> you too? Yeah. It's good to have friends. It's good to share with them. It helps us get perspective on things. in a way that, we, that just my wife and I couldn't. I think you know that if you've raised, if it's just Lise and I that went out and talked about the kids, we'd be, we'd be in, the same, you know, in the same trap. But the fact that we could kind of share with another couple the joys, it wasn't all you know, trouble, the joys and the challenges of raising small children. Yeah, that was like somehow for a moment we felt, yeah, we can do this. This is a good thing. So my friends, they help and they encourage and they console me for the various challenges in my life. Verse 12a, he says, and if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. We need protection, don't we? We need protection from physical and spiritual danger in this world. I need my friend to defend me when others are gossiping against me. You know, my car has problems. My friends who know about cars protect me from you know, being ripped off by some you know, unscrupulous garage or something like that. So Solomon concludes by extending his thought in verse 12b by saying, a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. If two friends are good, then three are even better. The point is that the way to leave the island of loneliness is to build a bridge of escape one friend at a time. So Solomon teaches us that loneliness can strike at the top or at the bottom. But the antidote is to cultivate companionship. And we can do that at all ages, can't we? It takes on different forms as we, as we grow older. And he provides various reasons why this is so. Companions help calm the storms of life. 
either by intervening or helping us, even by sharing their own experiences with us to help us understand that the storm that I'm going through you know, is similar to the storm that my friend is going through. And even though I cannot stop his storm or her storm and she cannot stop my storm, the fact that we understand that both of us are going through something difficult or similar helps us deal with the reality that we have to deal with. Uh, you know, uh, as you know, I've had the flu for a while and there's nothing funny about that until I walked into Marty's office and he said, don't come any closer, I've got the flu. And we both burst out laughing, you know, I mean. <laughs> and then we compared coughs, you know, it was, it was a moment, we had a moment. <laughs> nothing funny about that, you know, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but somehow, oh dear, poor Marty, he's, gonna, he's not going to go through what I went through for the last couple of weeks. You know, and I'll pray for him, you know, but somehow, yeah, that's life, isn't it? That's life, life is like that. We have all our aches and pains. He also says, companions reassure us when we are vulnerable, when we're exposed, when we're self-conscious. I don't know how many times I've said to my friend, I won't, even, I won't mention names, but to try to help them accept certain weaknesses that they have, that they're always, you know, oh, you know, I'm such a whatever, you know, I, I wish I could do better, I've never been able to do this, you know. And my task for my friend was to encourage that person to say, no, come on, look at this that you've done and look at that that you've done. And sometimes that type of encouragement is more um, believable coming from a friend. It's like our children, you know, we would say, I would say to one of my daughters or sons, ah, oh, you did great, you know, that was wonderful, you know, I'm really proud of you, blah, blah. And their answer was, yeah, you're supposed to say that, you're my dad. You know, I'm a winner anyway, any which way, you know, because you're my dad. You know? And I, I get what he's saying. I remember being young when my mother used to say, oh, that's wonderful, oh, mom, you know, nothing to it. But if your friend, if your friend reaffirms you, and tells you, man, you did a great job. Somehow that has a little more meaning because they're not invested as your parent. <laughs> so companions, you know, they reassure us when we're vulnerable, when we need actual building up. And then he says, companions take our part when others try to take us apart. I remember uh, Julia and Paul would fight and fight. Those are our two eldest. They would fight and fight and fight. And, oh, my, oh, you know how it is. They were just sibling rivalry. It was terrible. It was driving us crazy. Nothing one did was okay with the other. The other would try to sink the other every chance they got. Except one day there were a bunch of boys you know, who were picking on Paul, you know, he was coming home, he was trying to get away from them, they were bigger boys and they were on top of him and they were trying to punch him and this and that. Boy, Julia went out of the house like a whirlwind. Jumped on those guys like a she-tiger, you know, she, wow. <laughs> Don't you hurt my brother. Again, I'm not saying anything you haven't experienced with your family as well, but of course, five minutes later, she was squealing on him for something else to get him in trouble. But you know, we need friends to, to you know, when, when our friend says, I got your back, that's, that's a good thing. We need friends. I believe that more than anything else in my Christian life, the Christian friends that Lise and I have made have been the cure for much of the loneliness that we have experienced because of our conversion, because of our work in the ministry and the many moves that we made in the, you know, the last 38 years, more than 20 moves, that's a lot of moving. But some friends remain constant from one move to another. We just hung on to a certain number of friends. How many times were we the new people in the congregation, having to start all over again? And yet, somehow, God was good, 
helped us to make friends. We have friends in Texas and Canada. We have friends in Tennessee, certainly in Oklahoma, so many congregations. And here chalked our home congregation for these many, many years. Friends have managed to keep you know, the wolf of loneliness away from our door. I'm persuaded that many of you who have been a part of this class you know, can relate to what I'm saying because of your moves and your changes in your life. So I leave you with a verse from a song, not usually what I like to do. I don't normally quote secular poets, but this one's pretty perfect. By Paul Simon, expresses how you know, I have felt about our Christian friends throughout the years. And I think it's a familiar song, Bridge Over Troubled Water. One of that verse, one of that verse uh, the first verse when he says, uh, when you're down and out, when you're on the street, when evening falls so hard, I will comfort you. I will take your part. Oh, when darkness comes and pain is all around, like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. What a beautiful, wonderful sentiment. We cannot make it through days of delusionment and times of trouble without our friends. And so when it comes to loneliness, one person plus a friend equals survival. All right, so that's our lesson on this particular topic. Uh, it is self-contained in that small passage there. I didn't want to start another new topic. We'll just continue with Ecclesiastes next time we get together. Thank you for your attention.